Good evening, my friends. It's our February 24th discussion group, and we're going to start off with prayer by Megan Marie Molina. <laughs> our loving God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together um, and to be united by your love because that is one thing that we all feel, that we all believe and that we know is so important. That is our reason for living, to live in your love, to experience your love for us and your love for others, and to then let your love pour out to one another. And I just pray that our discussion tonight is totally led by you, and I pray that we open up our hearts and come with a an open spirit to receive what you have for us today. And I am just so excited to hear everyone's voices um, because it just shows how unique you made us all and how we all have, a, although we may have different stories and different backgrounds, your love is just in all of it. And I'm so thankful for that. So, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is meeting number seven on this topic. I think it's like we're getting close to meeting number 50 um, of our discussion group online, which is kind of crazy. And um, so I, I really did a lot of reflecting. I, of course, I listened to the, the whole meeting again when I edited it and um, been praying about it. And as you probably saw in my email, decided to really bounce off of Marguerite's comment from last week. Margaret, Marguerite's comment was, I think we've spent a lot of time discussing and debating whether or not homosexuality, living in that lifestyle is a sin or not. And, and honestly, I think most of us has probably figured out where we land on that chart or we're maybe like straddling a line between two of them, between you know, two and three or three and four and trying to figure out where we stand. And, and so doing another three weeks, one on each of the scriptures, I just felt like maybe it was time to kind of go ahead and launch forward and discuss how do we really respond to people that are living in a way that maybe we don't agree with or um, that we're unsure about what God thinks of it or that's just plain old different than the way that we live. And, and I think this is a really good conversation, not just about homosexuality, but about, about a lot of things. So I'm kind of excited about moving into that discussion. But before we do that, I want to go ahead. I want to honor um, the fact that we have, everything that we've discussed so far. And I feel like it's been a really good discussion over the weeks where we have um, looked at scriptures. We've looked at different ways of viewing them. We've debated each other we, in love and agreed to disagree on a few things, but we're all still here. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for being here, meeting number seven on this topic. And I want to honor that by just kind of doing a review and kind of giving that kind of tying it up and putting a bow on it to say, here's, here's what the different views are. And then what I'm going to do is send you an email with resources for each of the views. One of the most helpful things for me has been watching the debates. I've watched so many debates between different views and it's really helpful. And so what I'll do is I'll send you some links to some debates, um, some books you can read, some articles you can read. And if, if, if let's just say you're trying to decide between column two and three and, and you're not really sure, um, I'm, uh, you can read and dig into it and do a little homework and, and make your decision about where you land on this. But I think what we can all agree on is that God wants us to treat everybody with the love that he gives us, that same love and that same grace. And so, although that can be, how we treat people can be affected by whether we think something they're doing is a sin or not, um, 
the question is, how are we supposed to treat people? Period or question mark. <laughs> and um, so I think that would be a great conversation because homosexuality is not the only thing on the table that we struggle with when we talk to other people who who disagree with us or we disagree with them. So um, these are the three scriptures. And like I said, instead of going through each one, taking a whole week on each one, I think it was said last week, we could probably do this for another 20 weeks and we're still not going to come to a consensus where we all believe the exact same thing. But I, I do believe that God wants us to have this conversation and to come out on the other side, um, loving like Jesus loves. So this is our famous chart we've been referring to. And so this is my quick review, and then we're going to get into the discussion. So this is column one, complete send you, side X. Those are just some of the labels we've been. And these are generalizations. There may be variations within this view. So please uh, forgive me if not, if this do, if you're in this column and this doesn't d totally describe you, it's just because um, we have to kind of group things together. So this is the complete send view that all sexual attraction and gender variance outside of heterosexuality within marriage is a sin. Um, and this view does not support gay marriage. Same-sex attraction is a choice. Same-sex attracted Christians must reject their attractions and work toward changing their attractions. The creation account in Genesis sets the standard and does not allow any variance. All same gender attraction is a picture of self-love and lust, self-lust, because it is someone that is the same as you. That's a big thing, which I was unaware of before. Um, and the belief that uh, since, what was that supposed to, oh yeah, <laughs> I guess I didn't, didn't finish that. I was going to write, um, believe that since the sexual act does not produce children, it's not procreative, procreative, that it is a sin. And um, to be LGBTQ is to be in rebellion, to reject God's good plan for personal holiness. So that is the complete sin view. Okay. One of the books that I have not shown you before is called, What Does the Bible Teach About Homosexuality by Gavin Peacock and Owen Strachan. And um, there's a quote here from that the book, homosexuality is sinful. This is true at every level, homosexuality identity, homosexual thinking, homosexual desires, homosexual actions. There's no part of homosexuality that the Bible sanctifies and calls holy. There's no part of homosexuality that we can distinguish as good. There's no part of homosexuality that a Christian can embrace. So that's that's view X and that's column one. Um, column two, partial sin view, side B, which uh, is same-sex attraction, SSA is not a sin, but acting on it is. Same-sex attraction is not a choice. Same gender attraction and all sexuality is something to surrender to God who might heal and transform the desires or give the strength and commitment to live a celibate lifestyle. Both their view is that both Old and New Testament passages make it clear that homosexual activity is sinful and does not please God. The creation account in Genesis sets the standard of male and female union and does not allow any variance. People with same-sex attraction can serve in leadership if they are not embracing it as their identity and are not living a gay lifestyle. And the church should provide a loving place for people with same-sex attraction to live in community and not be relegated to lives of loneliness. And some of the proponents of this view are Christopher Ewan and his book, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. And we heard from him a couple weeks ago and Wesley Hill and the book Washed and Waiting. And both of them would say that they are not repressing their sexual desires. They have their sexual desires have been uh, redeemed and that um, it's not a matter of just hunkering down and white knuckling it, but they actually have given their sexuality completely and totally to God. And this is where they've landed with celibacy. Mm -hmm. yep. Side A, um, this is accommodation, sin view. So this is, side A covers both of these next two columns. Um, oh, the, the, they came in differently. Okay, same-sex attraction is not God's original design, but it is acceptable in a broken world like divorce and accommodations can be made such as gay marriage. Um, it's not consider considered normative, but it's also not considered a sin. Same-sex attraction is not a choice. 
Conversion therapy and praying the gay OA do not work. The call to celibacy is not for everyone. Using consistent biblical hermeneutics and historical context that the church has used for centuries, the six main passages referring to same-sex activity and do not prohibit committed, loving, same-sex relationships, but rather um, gang rape, violence, pedestry, and temple prostitution. And that kind of is the summary of the New Testament, Old and New Testament passages of, of how they do not believe that the Bible prohibits a gay marriage or, or say, uh, same sex committed gay relationships. The normal variant view is that God has either designed or allowed a small percentage of the population to be born gay. It is just another normal variant with no disability or moral stigma attached. God blesses same sex marriages as they pursue monogamy, fidelity, and faithfulness. God does not call all gays to be celibate. Using, in this, the same paragraph, using consistent biblical hermeneutics and historical context, those passages are not prohibiting committed, loving, same-sex relationships. And condemning same-sex relationships and transgender identity bears bad fruit in the lives of the LGBTQ people, such as suicide and lots of shame and excommunication from the church. And there's a better way, and it includes God and the Bible and celebrating people. Okay. Oh, some proponents of, of this one are Justin Lee and um, Kathy, Kathy Broderick. Um, so what do all these views have in common? We know what they have. I just listed all the differences pretty much. What they have in common is that these people, they're people who love God and they see their need for Jesus as their savior. And none of them believe that giving into lust or promiscuity are in obedience with the way that God created us to live. All of them are looking to scripture to inform their decisions, although the way they read scripture varies. And most of all, the views believe that the church needs to do a better job at responding to this issue. The disagreement would be in how the church can do a better job. So those are the things that I see that are in common. Um, and that brings us to the question for the night, which is, how do we see people like Jesus sees them? And how do we treat people who do not agree with, who we do not agree with, or whose behavior we do not agree with. And I'm gonna close my screen so I can see everybody's faces. And um, I'm gonna set the stage and then I'm gonna open it for um, comments. So before we get into trying to discuss how we should treat people that we don't see eye to eye on these things with, I want you to erase homosexuality from your mind for just a minute or just set it to the side. And I want you to think about these questions, okay? Let's say you believe that smoking cigarettes is a sin. Let's just say that that's a firm belief you have because of all the scriptures that talk about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And yep. your, your friend confesses to you I cannot quit smoking. How do you react? Okay, hold that thought. I won't answer yet. What if you believe that you should not view other naked bodies and other people having sex? And so you believe that rated R movies are a sin. And all your friends watch them all the time, whatever. What do you do? How, how do you how do you talk to them? Do you say something? Do you not say something? Do you just live out your your morality and not worry about what they're doing? Okay. Next question. What if you believe that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and your friend overeats a lot of junk food? Do you say something, or is that like meddling in their business? Or do you just take care of your own? How do you talk about that? How do you, what does that look like for you? Um, what if you have a friend who got married young, let's say really young, 18, 19, and they've been in this marriage and they fight all the time. They've gone to counseling. They cannot seem to get along. They got married too soon for their own reasons. They have no children. There's no infidelity and um, there's no abuse. And the, the, your friend comes to you and says, 
we're getting, we, we're getting a divorce because we just can't get along. What do you say to them? Um, what about your grand, your granddaughter comes to you and says, um, I've decided I'm going to school to become a pastor. And you know that Paul says in the scripture that women should be silent in the church. What do you say to your, what do you say to her? How do you discuss that scripture with your granddaughter? Or what if, um, what if your niece comes to you and says, I've always been a boy in my mind. I, I, I'm not a girl. Like when I see myself, I see myself as a boy. And so I'm going to, um, uh, oh man, I lost the word. I'm going to, anyway. Transition. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping somebody would come to my rescue. I'm going to transition um, to do the whole thing, the whole nine yards, um, to live out the way that I believe I was created, which is to be a male. And then the last one, let's say your son comes to you and says, I've been living a lie my whole life and I'm gay and I'm going to divorce my wife and I'm still going to be a dad to my kids, but I just can't live out this lie anymore. Okay, there you go. I threw a bunch of them at you. I'm going to open the floor. I think what I'd like to discuss is what are some of the guidelines that we have in scripture to discuss these important topics um, with people that we care about. I'm not talking about getting up and doing a debate on a stage. I'm talking about people you know, people you love, um, people who have a relationship with, somebody who trusts your opinion and comes to you and says, what do you think? Or in some of those scenarios, um, they're just living out a lifestyle next to you that you don't agree with. You know, in those cases, do you say anything or do you not say anything? Um, do you just let your life speak or do you wait for an opportunity? Um, wait till they have a heart attack and then you talk to them about their diet. I mean, like these are, these are the big questions. So uh, Janice already has her hand up. Is that a hand or are you waving at a customer? <laughs> okay, that's a hand. Okay, so go ahead and unmute Janice and kick us off into this discussion. I'm sorry I got in late for you guys, but I'm off today, so I'm at home, and hopefully you won't hear my little puppy barking because she's barking at Aww. somebody. But, um, yeah, I got a chance to listen to uh, the uh, last week's because I had some issues at work that I couldn't participate, but I was really sad. But, um, yeah, and I, I was uh, like Marguerite's question because that's where I kept falling is uh, – we never too far from God. There, there's just no, no way because he's everywhere. He's all things. He's everything. So there's no way that I can go too far from where he can't reach me or grab me from what, where I'm at. And I'm talking about this because it's a personal thing to me. I know where I've been. I know the depths of where I've been. And I know that it was because of him and the prayers that my church family was praying for me that dragged me up out of that. So I've never been, nobody can ever get too far where he can't reach you. And if I'm, if I'm personally living and breathing and moving in the precious love that he's given to me freely, I, I don't do nothing just because I'm a human, he loves me. If I move in that, that's going to not only attract that other person who's going through something, but it's going to also show them how to live because that, that's what he does he is the spirit is in us the spirit knows each other so most of the time when we meet up people meet up together it's the spirit that meets it's not really humans that meet it's it's actual the spirit meets the spirit the spirit knows the spirit so that connects us to each other the spirit is the one who will lead us and guide us into whatever uh, we need to do to talk or say or whatever as long as we're praying while we're doing it because a lot of times we start talking we just be talking because we just be talking but the spirit has a way of pulling us and allowing us to be present within that person 
to where we can reach into that spirit and connect to that spirit and that we can draw that person into where they need, need to go with whatever problems they're going through. That's why it's always good to tell your story. It's not good to keep your story. You need to tell your story. I mean, you know, so or whatever. But anyway, um, if in fact there is so much pressure on us to quote unquote live the Bible, then me as a black person would not be received into this quote unquote Christian life because the Bible was used to keep me separate from everything. I wasn't even allowed to marry even within my own race because I wasn't even considered a race. So, so we have to be involved more than just in this human lifestyle that has been built on human people and their thoughts and desires and dreams and whatever they think should be. Because it's just in the last century that I have been able to even just vote, <laughs> you know, and everything that has been built has been built on the black of, back of my black slaves. So even the White House was built on black slaves. I'm not even allowed to go in there. I can't go to the, to the, um, courthouse that I built, that my family built, my, my ancestors built. So we can't keep that as quote unquote, uh, I, I don't know what to say about that, but it's, it is more deeper than that. We have to get up off the surface and we have to dig inside of us because that's the only way things will change. It's a change of a heart. It's a heart thing. It has nothing to do with what you look like, what you label yourself as, it's your heart that God is in the process of changing. He's in the restoration business. He is restoring all of us each and every day, every second of the day. That's what he does. That's his job. So it's about our hearts. We, we can't have a hard heart. We have to allow the spirit to move us in love and in passion because that's what he is. He's love. He, he, he he takes everybody, he, he loves, he gave his son so everybody could be a part of him. Not just because you're white or just because you're a heterosexual, everybody, he gave his son so everybody could come to him and be free and, and, and just be ha happy in him. And, and the sad thing is that we're so scared to allow our hearts to just be open to all of that, to the love that is so freely given to us. We sin every single day. I mean, you know, I had a little confrontation with somebody the other day and the first thought that came to my mind, I don't want to be bothered with you. You, who are you? You, you not nobody, but you have to come back to the point that that's still God's child. I don't care if he is on drugs or she's doing, that's God's child. He and she is created in the image of God. So who am I? You know, so I love what Marguerite said. It's the love of Christ that gives me the, prov the provision to be what I am, to be who I am. It's the love of Christ. And if I allow that love of Christ to work and move and breathe in me, then I'm not gonna worry or, about what you call yourself. That's not my problem. My problem is to get my heart clean with God so that I can be what he wants me to be. So uh, that's that's my story. <laughs> Are you sticking to it? <laughs> that's your yeah, story and you're sticking to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you Janice for sharing your heart with such passion. I really appreciate that. Um, would anybody else like to talk about um, how you respond to people who live differently than you or who believe differently than you? How do we respond to them? What are some of the guidelines? Janice listed the guideline of love and getting our own heart right first before we worry about fixing other people and defining their lives. Uh, yeah, David. Yeah, I actually, I actually had like one of like one of the examples that Anne was talking about, but kind of in reverse. Um, like, like I'm a person who like thinks that a lot of like homosexuality is not a sin and like, I'm, I don't know, I'm very like beyond box four. Um, but I had a person come to me who, um, uh, they came to me and, and were struggling 
with a lot of like self hatred. Uh, they said how they, they they knew that like being gay was a sin. They knew that like all, there was all these like lists of sexual sins that they said like I know these are wrong, but I do them and I feel terrible about, my, about myself. And they came to me and like and said like I don't really know who else to go to, but you seem like someone who couldn't talk to me about these, and I need help. And like in that moment, like even though I'm a person who who would um, in in other situations like I would love to preach about like hey guys this is not a sin. But like when that person came to me and said like, hey, I know these things are a sin and I'm struggling with them and I need your help. Like my my own preachy uh, instinct had to take the back seat because like this is a person who needs my help. And so like, so I said to them, I don't like, I won't go into like the details of the conversation, but basically like, hey, you know, it's okay. I know these are a sin and I know you're trying to do better. So here, I'm gonna help you like find some tips about how to deal with this sinful nature because even though you're doing wrong, like I'm gonna try to like help you because I love you because Jesus loves you. And like, that was like the whole conversation. Like I never actually like told them what my, my beliefs were. I sort of like went with whatever they believe. Like, all right, this, you believe this, this is where you're at and you need help with this problem. So I'm gonna help you with that problem as best as I can. And so like, I don't know, that's, that's kind of my philosophy um, that like there's times when you can like tell, tell the people around you, here's what I believe and why I believe it. But then there's other times when like, when you have a person in your face and they're asking for help and it's like, I don't know, I gotta, I gotta go with whatever they're doing, dealing with and like help them where they are. So that's, that's kind of my, my, my thought on it. Great. That, that's helpful. So you're saying that um, you didn't challenge their beliefs that those things were a sin. You just, you helped them within the framework that they already came to you with. Is that right? Yeah. So like, okay. I'm gonna, like, if you believe that you're doing the sinful thing, then like, I'm going to help you. Not I'm going to help you with that. And I'm sure just listening to them, the fact that they came and talked to you took a lot of courage. Right, and yeah. so for you to then just be on their side and in, in trying to combat that was probably very encouraging for them. So thank you for sharing that. That's um, anybody else have a yeah, mom, Joan? Well, I haven't been volunteering at the pregnancy center during the pandemic, but before that I had been a volunteer for 10 years as an advocate meeting with these mostly young women um, who are pregnant and the majority of them were not married, you know, and uh, were with a boyfriend that maybe was good and maybe was mistreating them. But, you know, we looked at every one of them as a child of God and that we, our focus was to tell them that God loves them and then to listen to their story and then give them help, whatever help we could. You know, we do the ultrasound so they could see um, the, the unborn baby. And then I didn't have, in those 10 years, I only maybe had one or two gals that were going to have an abortion. But even if they said that's where they were leaning, then we would talk to them, give them the facts. We had, you know, uh, information about abortions, the types of abortion and, and you know, the the side effects, everything. And, but we didn't ever look down on them if that was what their choice was. We tried to give them choices where they don't get that at Planned Parenthood. They don't get choices. You go there and they're gonna get an abortion. So we tried to give them all the options that were available, give them any help that, that we could, but doing all that in love. And these gals yeah. were so thankful and grateful for the loving atmosphere at the pregnancy center that they came there, they felt safe, they felt loved, and they didn't feel judged. So that's been well, my experience. That's great that you um, met them where they were and you um, upheld the honor and dignity of who they are. Right. And then gave them, gave them choices. That's what God does with us, right? He gives us choices. So in love, that's good. Anybody else want to share um, how you help people deal with, pe sit with people? So I saw Sierra's hand first and then Cindy. And was there another hand? Okay, go Sierra and then Cindy. Um, I, I operate out of the, the notion that um, anything that gives you peace is permissible. Um, and what I mean by that is that like, like David, I'm, I'm beyond side A. There was a letter before A, I'm there. Um, but 
I know, like, whether if it's the is the issue of LGBTQ plus or um, like other uh, other topics of like sex, um, uh, abortion or um, you know politics, whatever, or even faith. Um, that while there are there are things that I believe that are good and things that I believe are harmful. I don't like to qualify things as sin or not sin. Um, that if something truly gives another human peace and contentment, uh, I believe that they are closer to God, even if they don't art art articulate it as God, than they would be if they just follow what I believe. Um, so for example, someone like uh, Wesley, the 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 guy on the other side of the debate not the bald man but the other man Wesley <laughs> Washington right. waiting Wesley yeah he truly he seems like it from mm -hmm. the video that he has peace where he has landed um and I and I and I trust that anyone who comes to him whoever follows him buys his books and listens to his messages are finding peace in that so you know, we're going to tell a gay person like hey like be gay and be proud. Like if you if you want to follow that message and that gives you peace, like go ahead. That is that is you, man. Um, and it's the same for um, and same for anybody else on, on any other part of the spectrum. Um, as long as you're not harming someone else by trying to impose your belief on someone. Uh, who would not have peace if they had the belief. Um, I say that um, because I've been having a lot of conversations um, with peers of mine who are um, struggling with religious trauma, uh, people who are recovering from um, growing up in or holding on to very toxic religious beliefs. Um, and you know, mostly within the within the Christian community, um, and one of the struggles that I've I've heard from people is that, like they they walked away from those beliefs, whether they comp whether they completely call themselves like atheists now or like they're still Christian, but like there's a lot of fundamental Christian beliefs that they've let go of, and they feel happier. They uh, they feel at peace, they feel content, they, they find more joy in life, they smile more, they feel less anxiety, they feel less shame. Um, and so they're truly proud of the place that they're in after walking away from, from religion. Um, and the people that they talk to from their religious communities, um, you know, one, want them to come back, like, oh man, you're just a lost soul, oh man, you just need to come to my church. Oh man, you just need to read the Bible the way I do. Like, oh man, like basically trying to re-traumatize them with all the same BS that they heard throughout their whole life. Um, and the struggle that they have is that like uh, a lot of religious folks get so caught up in trying to put our beliefs on other people that we cannot see the value in the actual human in front of us. Like we don't care about their happiness. We just want to make sure that they believe the right thing. Like we don't care about their peace. We just want to make sure that they, you know, have like all their sins or not sins are checked off. Um, so all that to say, I think uh, this whole like how to treat people, uh, if, if someone were to someone were to come with me with any of those problems that you listed in the beginning, I, I'd be like, are you at peace? Like what gives you what gives you joy? What makes you feel the most alive and human? And if it's like, I, 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 I wanna lay down my same sex attraction and marry someone of the opposite sex, I'd be like, dope. There are resources for that. Go on that path. But if it's, I wanna be who I am, I wanna be 
same sex attracted or trans or this or that and the other. I'm like, go be that too. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. For um, your, your, the way that you would approach somebody who came to you. Jesus is applauding you. Okay. Cindy was next. And then I thought I saw one more hand, but I'll um, wait until she's done. Uh, basically being a Christian woman, which I am led by the Holy spirit. I do have my armor of God on and I do stand in the truth. And I think we all need to stand in the truth um, and pray. We need to pray about it and give it to God because it is not ours. It's not ours. It's God's. And that's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to put it. Um, yep. And I think we, we've said that a, a number of times along the way that, that we, we can't change anybody's desires or we just can't, we, we, we can't even change our it's own hearts. So it is, it's, it's a Holy I mean, spirit. I stand thing. in the truth and I'm not going to lie to somebody and tell them that it's not a sin because the Bible tells us otherwise, but I will give them love and encouragement and I will pray with them. I will definitely pray with them and I'll tell them the same thing, give it to God, pray and give it to God because it's his, it's not ours. It's not our war, it's God's. So that you're saying that would be your response to any of those things I listed like smoking yeah. or divorce or yeah okay awesome yeah, all of them daryl you're next <laughs> thank you very much <clears throat> it's hard to follow all the all the good things that have been no there's been a lot of good things that have been said yeah there's there's only one answer that we as christians are mandated to always have up, um, um, available and it's first peter three or something i forgot uh exactly it's first peter three always be prepared to give an answer when someone asks you about the hope hope that is in you that lies within and you. that that verse is misquoted far more often than it's properly quoted because people usually say always the bible tells us to always have an answer no it doesn't mm, period as a matter of fact yeah. as a matter of fact Jesus and the Apostle Paul and Peter and lots of other spots tell us, don't try to formulate an answer in advance. Let the Holy Spirit give you the answer. Know the facts, right? Know what you believe, but don't try to formulate an answer in advance. And everybody just about does that sometimes, right? Even while somebody else is talking, they're thinking about, let's see, now, how am I going to answer this? What am I going to say? What if he says that? What if she says that? And I'm going to say this and that. So there's only one circumstance where we're outright commanded to always be prepared to give an answer and that is about our hope and our hope is in jesus we're not mandated to give an answer if somebody asks us where do we think it's a sin to do thus and such and as a matter of fact nowhere in the new testament do you find any of the apostles trying to convince anybody of anything except for one you know what that is that jesus is the person who became the Christ. Many convincing proofs, you know, you'll read that over and over again. The Bereans are a good example of that. So it's not my job to convince anybody that what they're doing is a sin. And I don't even have to answer them if they ask me if I think it's a sin. I really don't. What I can say is, you know, um, and this might be a good way to answer it. I spent quite a bit of time with some good friends of mine pondering this very question. And they're seven or eight spots in the Bible, depending on how you read, you know, some of them, where this question is, 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 is addressed head on. Let me give you what those scriptures are. Read them for yourself and come to a conclusion. Now, in my mind, if the Holy Spirit doesn't work with that person to come to, to the right conclusion, who am I, right? Number one. And number two, I cannot give them the right conclusion because if they're not going to accept it, they're not going to accept it anyhow. But I will say this. I will say that there have been very few if well there have been a very very few times a couple i can think of where somebody who who let's just homosexuality has been the discourse so far so let's talk about that very very few times has anybody confided in me that they're homosexual or that they had a homosexual experience and asked me what i thought about it and was sincerely desiring to know 
what I thought about it. Typically, people have said, you know, by the way, I'm gay. Or, um, you know, have you ever been attracted to men because I am? You know, things like that. But it's generally not to find out what I think about it religiously. In fact, it's almost never the case. Most people that I hear talking about homosexuality are heterosexual people talking to heterosexual people about homosexuality. And and it's almost always judgmental. It's almost always a a question of how sinful is it or isn't it. Okay. But if a gay person were to ask me, hey, what do you think of this? I think there's three things that they want to know, and they always want to know those same three things. Is it okay? Well, by whose standard? And what do you mean okay? You mean does God okay it? Right? That's one thing they want to know. Is it okay? The second thing they want to know is, am I okay? And that has two pieces. That's why there's three of them. First one is, am I okay with you? Mm-hmm. This being the case as it is. Okay. Yeah. And the second one is, am I okay with God? Well, that second one's a lot bigger than me. Mm-hmm. And if okay. my answer when they ask me, am I okay with you, isn't, you bet you are, then mm-hmm. I'm not a Christian. So the question of whether it's a sin, and I have my own conclusions, and I've already articulated what those are. I mean, I saw one of those cases a while ago where they said um, it, the attraction is not a sin. Indeed, it is not a sin. There's no attraction that is a sin. Attractions are natural. Lust is a sin. Covetousness is a sin. Yep. Certain acts are sinful. And we, as people, as fallen humans, are sinful. But an attraction is like two magnets that attract each other. I mean, it's, it's a natural attractiveness and attraction are natural. Is it, it, if, it's, if it's wrong to have an attraction, then it's wrong to be attractive. Can you change your attractiveness? <laughs> you can't any more than you can change your attractions to certain things. Anyway, so that's my take. I have one answer that I'm required to always be prepared to give. And I'm almost outright required not to not to have it even formulated. In either case, because you don't know which person is going to ask it, what their circumstances are, um, what the setting is going to be, and what the exact question is going to be, and and what the Holy Spirit is going to guide you and that other person to discuss. And it it falls, I think, just short of sinfulness to try to formulate those answers in advance. Anyhow, that that's my perspective. The hope that lies within you. Which is your testimony, and nobody can argue with that. <laughs> um, that is absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Daryl. That's that's good. I know where my hope is for sure. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to share? Was that a Janice hand? Okay. Are you waving at me, Janice? Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say that I think that there, because Christ is so big, that there's room at His table for all of us. There's none of us that there's not room for all of it. And so we as people are the ones who are not making room for the ones who um, consider themselves homosexual or whatever the, the problem is or whatever. They're the ones that's not knowing that there's room at the table for them, that there's that God has opened his heart for them, that they, they're the, he, he, he doesn't need to he's not asking for you to be your own healer he said by my stripes you are healed so he's not even asking you to do that you know so we have to be willing to make room for them at our table as well this human table that we live in this world that we live in we have to make room for them because god's already made room for them you know so that's why i believe that uh it's so much that's in our hearts and in our minds. We can't get fixated on, uh, I like how you said that, the sin, because, you know, sin is one of those things that holds guilt and shame and all that. And he took all of that. So we don't even have to allow ourselves to get in that. So that's us doing that. That's us as humans, as people, putting that onto them because God took all that away. So, We just have to, in our hearts and in our minds, consider ourselves, how he's made room for us and what we have done. Maybe we aren't quote unquote or homosexual or whatever, but he's made room for us in all of our whatever we are. 
So who are we not to make room at our own personal tables for them in this human realm that we live in? That's what I, I think. I, you, you, can't, you can't get bogged down in your mind whether something's right or wrong or indifferent or whatever. You just need to make room for them at the table so that they don't feel left out because they're not left out on God's table. Thank you, you know, Janice. I wish the yeah. doxological ovations of Janice's were written down somewhere because I could listen to them for 24 hours a day, literally. <laughs> because, I mean, it's there's nothing like just plain old truth, right? There's nothing like spirit-led truth. And that's what I just heard. I heard from her all the time. <laughs> but I just thought that was, that was, that was beautiful. And um, th there's one thing that I said, and I've said consistently, you don't have a right to condemn yourself. You can't right. forgive yourself. So who are you to think that you can condemn? You don't belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus. That's his job. And you know what? It, you've heard people say, well, it's the devil's fault. No, it's Jesus's fault. He took the fault. He took it on himself. It's his fault. It, the fault's all his. The blame's all his because he took it on himself. That's awesome. I, I, I want to share a story and, and then I'll, I'll go to Cindy. Um, this was about 20 years ago. Funny enough, the girl's name was Cindy. <laughs> um, so one of our first big things that happened when we became pastors 20 years ago. And um, God taught us a really big lesson in that in this story about our calling. We, he, he very clearly told us your job is not to manage people's sin. Because so many people think that pastors are supposed to get the sin out of the church, you know. And so what happened is... Uh, one of the ladies that went to our church brought a friend and she was very meek and mousy and, and very unsure of herself. And, and you could tell she had been in an abusive relationship and was actually still in it. And she started coming to church and like, you could see her shoulders lift and she started running PowerPoint and playing. Then she got to play the fiddle at church and she counseled for baptism. She wanted to get baptized. And of course, Mark and I, we're like, she's responding to the call of Jesus. Of course, we're going to counsel her. We talked with her. She was in a 13-year common-law marriage with a guy that was, had he had her like this. He had taken away all of her rights. She couldn't drive, couldn't work, couldn't have friends. Going to church was a stretch. But we'd get her a ride every week. We would pick her up from, she lived in, the, in a little pickup truck. You know who I'm talking about, Janice. A little pickup truck. They lived in a camper. It's got a little camper shell. That's where they lived. And we'd pick her up and take her to church. And the day that we were going to baptize her, along with a few other people, I we had it. Well, actually, it was before a week before. A gentleman came up to us and said, "I, I have to leave this church." He said, "You you can't baptize someone who's living in sin." And we sat down and had a long conversation about it, and we agreed to disagree, and we baptized her. And she was still living with this man not married right um and that was probably the least of the sins that were going on honestly um he had some real issues and um about a year and a half later in in I, I won't i make it sound like it was so easy for us to make that decision um when he came at us he came at us full force with all his scriptures in tow and his little white gloves doing the dirt test in the church and all that kind of stuff and Mark and I were like new pastors and we were, so we, we got counsel from a number of different people and we decided we're baptizing this girl. And a year and a half later, she was at work. The camper was there at the work job and she was at work and she heard the Holy Spirit because she was baptized and she was communing in an obedient way with him. She heard the Holy Spirit say, walk my princess I've got you. And she was like, okay. So she left wow. her job place and started walking. And she walked three miles to her friend's house. And the whole time she heard him kept whispering the same phrase over and over. Walk, my princess, I've got you. And she got to her friend's house and she said, I'm done. I'm, leave I'm, I'm done. I'm leaving him. She left her 100-year-old fiddle and her dog in the trailer. And she, but she walked and th this gets even better. So, um, she calls me and tells me what's happening and that she had called her parents to say, come get me. They lived in Northern California 
And because this guy was abusive in a number of different ways, um, she was like, I'm not going back to the trailer. I'm just, I just want to go home. And her parents were divorced. And her dad was a non-believer, didn't believe, didn't even believe God existed. And he got down on his knees the night before she walked and said, God, if you're there, you need to save my daughter. And the next day she had the power and the ability to hear and she walked. Um, she now lives, she got a job, she got married. She plays in an orchestra for her city. She belongs to a thriving church. Anyway, awesome. I say all of that to say in the moment we felt we were, we were, we were in the middle of a test of how, how much are we going to require people to get their lives together before we allow them to be in the church or allow them to be uh, baptized or allow them to be in ministry. And God showed us so clearly that was, that was like the first thing he said was your job is not to manage people's sin. And people have left our church because we won't manage people's sin. And we won't. We just absolutely won't. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And yeah. our job is to do the other things which are super clear in scripture. How will they know you're my disciples? If you love one another, serve one another, lay down your life for one another. There's like a hundred one another's in the Bible that are super clear. Some of these other issues we talk about, smoking's not even in the Bible. Like, you know, like these things that are unclear, we're, we're not gonna mess with that. The Holy Spirit can mess with that. Our job right. is to love and to represent God who is, first John 4, 8, love. God is love and that's our job. And yeah. so how that varies, it varies depending on the person. Some people need a, a wake up call, a little shake. Some people need lots of encouragement and support. Some people need to be help, have help to forgive themselves and get rid of the condemnation. And, and it looks yeah. different in every situation. And that's why mm -hmm. you won't see Mark and I um, preaching on specific morality things because that's right. the Holy Spirit's job. That is not my job as a human being to make a rule that you have to live up to. My job is to preach the gospel and the hope, like you said, the hope that lies within me is that I'm in Christ, you're in Christ. He's already included all of humanity in his, res his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection. He has included us because he loves us that much. He would not, he would not, he, he would not require us to be better than him. Why would he say love your enemy when he doesn't? Of course he does. His love covers all of it. So anyway, that's, I finally said what I think, but anyway, okay, I'll stop. I just had to share that story about Cindy. Her name was Cindy, the redheaded oh. Cindy, Irish. She was, she, we still keep in touch. Hey, okay. I have some Irish in me. There you go. Okay, Cindy, but, you're up. You know, you have to, you have to know that it does say in the Bible that her husband didn't honor her, did he? You know, oh. nope. we are I supposed, we are supposed to be honored. I remember right? that story, Anne. So you well, were there. Oh yeah, yeah. We, me and her used to go get her to take, bring her to church. And you and uh, me would trade off. Yep. <laughs> so I remember that, and it's a, uh, it's a testimony to who, uh, we are in Christ. That's what brings people to Christ, is to see Him working in us. That's what will draw them to to unto Him that will draw men unto him is what we do with what we know and what we feel within the spirit the spirit's leading us to do that you know uh, i remember being so sad because uh sometimes she would be bruised you know coming to church she'd be bruised up you know but she yeah. never was in uh where she complained about it she talked about it, but she didn't complain about it. But I think in her heart, she always knew that she would eventually get out because she never was, uh, she never complained, but she talked about it. You know, it's a difference in complaining and talking. And, uh, but uh, I, I'm so happy that she, I, well, I saw her on Facebook, so I'm, I'm really happy about how, how that turned out. I guess, you know, in that situation, if we had denied her, to get baptized because she she needed to get herself out of living in sin 
which is ridiculous because we all live in sin. But anyway, my point being, you know, if we had tried to to do that, you know, God would still work with her, but she wouldn't have been in the same community with that same. I mean, she was open to the Holy Spirit. She believed that God was working with her. The shame that would have been over the, her life if I had said, I'm sorry, you're not good enough. You're not good enough to get baptized. Wh what? Like, can you imagine? Um, I would have been, I can't say that God couldn't have still done what he did, but I would have been a hindrance to what he was trying to do in her life. So Cindy, did you finish what you wanted to say? And then I'll go to Daryl. Or did you have something else you wanted to say? Yeah, I kind of did. Okay, so, go ahead. And then and, we'll go to and um, and that, and I totally agree with that. You know, um, like when I said that I stand in the truth because I have the armor gun, I stand in the truth for me, what I know, what I've read in the Bible, what I know, what the Holy Spirit showed me, I stand in the truth. Each person stands in their own truth. And if it comes from the Bible, usually we're all standing in the same truth, right? And uh, another thing too, uh, the table, the table's God's table. <laughs> you know what I mean? God, we can't do anything without God. There, we just cannot. Can't even breathe. Everything that is through us, God does through us. We don't do it. God does it. Okay. It's not us. It's God. So, and that's how we have to let it be. You know, we have to, we have to give it to God. It's God's. Just like that, that Cindy, God took care of her. The Holy Spirit took care of her. She, she got what she needed. God took care of her. She didn't, she would have done it whether she had you guys around there or not. It was going to happen. Right. That's right? right. So, and that's what I'm saying. It's God. Yeah. It's, it's him. Amen. You know, we have to not judge. We have to pray. Just like you said, we have to support each other the best that we can. But it, it's all got to come from God. I agree. You know? Yeah, Daryl? Yeah, I was just going to remark on red haired Cindy's situation. I bet, because you guys ever heard of Maggie's House? Maggie's House? When I was yeah. in the Air Force, I volunteered for Maggie's House a lot. And it's, um, I think it's, is it Maggie's house? Isn't it some other kind of house? For abused women? Yeah. Abused, yeah. abused women. But yeah. I don't think it's called Maggie. I think it's called something the else's one, house. But it's a there girl's There might name. be more. Yeah, oh. the, the one I volunteered for is called Maggie's house. And it's very oh, secretive. Okay. For good reasons. Anyway, I learned a lot um, about the abused spouse syndrome, which is, you know, I put this much into it. It must be worth this much. <laughs> you know, I bet, I would bet that there were times when Cindy thought, I'll never get out of this, ever, yeah. and she knew she never would, or thought she knew it. We're like that a lot when we look at other people. We don't think when we're way down at the end of the road, there's going to be God there with this person having been saved and born again and revitalized and matured. What we see is a, in our own mind, a center. If we turn the mirror around, we'd see an equally sinful center right here. You know, we should, because we're all sinful. But it, I, I, I think the lesson in all that is when, when, when you judge somebody for what they're doing or who they are or what you perceive them to be, you're judging, uh, what did um, Janice say a while ago? God's child. You're, you're judging God's child. That's not your prerogative. You don't have that right, including judging yourself. You don't have the right to judge yourself. Even the Apostle Paul said that, hey, that's Jesus' job to judge me. Even if I think I'm right, I still don't have the right to declare myself right because there may be something the Lord knows that I don't. So anyway, I just, I just thought there was a good analogy between Cindy's dark days and her brighter days later and um, a person who's caught up in some kind of of um a vice of any kind including smoking i guess and god's child that that person really is and where god's going to take them later on you mentioned earlier what about a person that says i can't quit smoking i guess my real question back to not an answer not yes you can my question would be how do you know you can't you haven't lived your whole life up yet i tell them to pray 
I quit. I quit smoking twice. <laughs> I quit. I quit smoking <laughs> once. I had. I had a. I went through the Kaiser Stop Smoking program five times wow. before I stopped oh, smoking. I, I didn't look. Five I quit once for seven years, and then I started and quit fourteen years later. I and smoked been, for thirty years. It's been about fifteen years now. The second time. Oh, I'm a born smoker. Trust me. I still love to smell cigarette smoke. Uh, Benny, <laughs> tobacco. Oh, yeah. oh. See, it makes, Benny, it makes me sick now. I, I can't do I can, it. Oh, not me. Not me. Smoke around no. me all you want to. I'm, hey, <laughs> if I could smoke, I'd smoke. Anyway, so the point is, if anybody can quit, I can quit. But I guess the, the real point behind it all is um, I'm not in the business of judging people. So don't ask me to judge you. Please don't ask me to because I won't. I'll find mm -hmm. a way not to. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Please don't ask me to because I won't. <laughs> well, it's it's eight oh one. Does anybody else have a burning comment or question or something, David? Yeah, what would you like to say? Oh yeah, no, I just um, I forget who it was, but someone was talking about like at the end of the day, like it's about it's about love. Like I think about the like if the, like the greatest commandment is kind of like how I measure like what I think about a, a theology, like. Like does that theology allow us to like love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors ourselves? And like, if it does, then like I think that that that's like a, a theology I can go with. If not, then like that that's a, that's my standard. And like, I think one one thing that that I take away from this group is like, even though th this particular is, is a topic where like a lot of us have very different different ideas about what's what's right, um, I can I I can at least tell that like everyone in this conversation, um, they're rooted in those two like. Will this help me like love the Lord my God and, and love other people myself? And I yeah, and I just wanted to say like I think everyone here um all have showed that we uh that we agree by those terms, basically. Yeah. So anyway. Preach it, David. That's a great way to end. I thank you for saying that. That's I, I honor that too, that that we all do love God and we we all want to love others as we love ourselves, which um, wasn't isn't always easy to love ourselves or to love others, but um, but that is the standard, and that's the, all the law and all the prophets hang on those two things. Yeah. Right. So yep. on that note, would somebody like to pray us out with the great commandments in mind? And loving God and loving our neighbor, just asking for the Holy Spirit to help us do that, because that is not something we can do on our own for sure, of our own flesh. Janice, thank you. Father God, we just thank you that we have you to come to at all times, no matter what the situation is, no matter what is going on, we can always come to you and that you have given us a comforter, the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us within the way in which we should go. We thank you for the hearts and minds that uh, are here tonight. We ask you, Father God, that you and only you will be able to impart to them what it is you need for them to know and how you need for them to do and be. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for you. We thank you that you forgive us of our sins. I thank you that you took all of our pain and all of our suffering and all the people around the world that are dealing with this situation. Father God, I ask you to give them peace, calm, and hope in you. In Jesus' holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Janice. Appreciate it very much. Thank you all for being on here. Um, let me ask this question. Do you think that we need to continue this discussion? Do you think this was a good wrap up? Do we move on to another topic? Um, or do, I mean, do we need to talk about transgender? We didn't even really talk about um, gender issues. I, it kind of all falls in the same area of of how yeah. how we love them we love them we accept them i mean if you know and we you know it'd be the same conclusion i think so too so are we ready to move on to another topic i think yes? so yeah okay well i'll tell you what um let me yeah. send out an email with the list that we came up with um of all wait, the various wait, wait, wait. Yeah. woke up never mind <laughs> see i sleep i'll go say wait Let's see what you think <laughs> um Oh yeah, did, did somebody have a comment? Okay, Sierra, go ahead. Um, 
we're not suggesting that we like keep going forever or like even for a whole nother thing, but we, uh, uh, and this is not an idea that everyone has to agree to, but we thought it might be good, at least for like maybe the beginning of the next week, kind of do a wrap up of the wrap up of more very practical ways of, of loving the LGBTQ community. Um, so I think we got to the good main conclusion, like, yeah, love, that's great, but like, how, uh, what how, does that mean? You know? What does it look like? <laughs> okay. Well, if anybody has anything they want to add to that conversation, um, bring it to the beginning of the next meeting. I think that's a good idea. Good, um, a good uh, segue into whatever we discuss next. And I'll send out the list so you can look at it and we can decide what we want to talk about next. So be, maybe be praying and thinking about something you'd like to discuss in this group and we can, um, you can bring it to the table next week and then we'll make a group decision. So whoever wants to be a part of making the decision about what we're gonna cover, make sure you're here next week. So um, yeah, so I'll stop recording. <laughs>